Welcome to this video. The first video in my series of videos on Cantor's 1895 and 1897 articles on the theory of aggregates and transfinite numbers. Section 1 is titled The Conception of Power or Cardinal Number. And this section starts off with Cantor's definition of the term aggregates, which is as follows. By an aggregate, we are to understand any collection into a whole M of definite and separate objects M of our intuition or our thought. These objects are called the elements of M. Cantor is also quoted in the introduction as saying, By a manifold or aggregate, I understand generally any multiplicity which can be thought of as one, that is to say, any totality of definite elements which can be bound up into a whole by means of a law. Here we see firsthand what Cantor imagined an aggregate to be. Notice that there is no axiomatic formulation here of the notion of aggregate, as might be expected in more contemporary works. Cantor has quite an informal style of definition. Personally, I feel that this is in line with Cantor's philosophy, and that he believed that through his mathematical works, he was simply making discoveries, and that these things, in this case aggregates, existed, and he was simply discovering what was being given to him by God. So it seems that Cantor would have believed aggregates potentially to exist in each individual person's mind in exactly the same way that they existed in his own mind, and that each person would understand his, that is Cantor's, statement of what an aggregate is in the same way that he himself understood it, and that no further elucidation of terms mentioned in the definition such as collection, elements and definite and separate objects was required. Works by Cantor's successors in the first half of the 20th century obviously showed that Cantor's conception of aggregate was far too simplistic, and led to severe logical difficulties such as the infamous Russell's paradox. Nevertheless, this is the notion of aggregate that we will continue to use throughout this series of videos. The notation m equals lowercase m embraces maybe looks a little bit strange to those familiar with modern set theory, since the symbol m embraces would probably be understood in a modern context as being a set with a single element, m. This is not the case in Cantor's notation. M embraces may represent an aggregate of more than one element, and possibly infinitely many elements. For example, later in the work the notation new embraces is used to symbolise the aggregate of finite cardinal numbers. The aggregates with a single element M, as we will see later, will usually be symbolised by M in parentheses. M embraces can be thought of as the aggregates of M's, that is, those objects identified as being M's or having the property of M-ness. M may indicate some kind of mark or property that each object in the aggregate M must possess. For future reference, the number in the brackets at the top left corner and similar bracketed numbers which appear throughout the work are the original page numbers of the article when it originally appeared in the journal whose name is shown on the screen now. The comments at the bottom of page 85 and top of page 86 regarding the uniting of many aggregates anticipates a notion that will be introduced properly in section 3 called the union aggregates. Note that Cantor only considers the uniting of aggregates which have no common elements. The case where aggregates have common elements, if there is indeed such a case to deal with, is not considered here. Bear in mind that often two aggregates, M and N, may have the same object as an element, but the instance of the object in the aggregate M will be considered as a separate instance of the object in the aggregate N when forming the union aggregate. The notation M, N, P and so on in parentheses does not indicate a new aggregate with elements M, N, P and so on, but a new aggregate whose elements are all of the elements of M and all of the elements of N and all of the elements of P and so on, combined together into a single, potentially unordered aggregate. Cantor gives a definition of the term part or partial aggregate of an aggregate M, and we see that part is a transitive relation. If M2 is a part of M1 and M1 is a part of M, then M2 is a part of M. The term part may be better understood here as being in the sense of proper part. Thus, a part of the aggregate M does not apply to M itself. I also just want to point out that there is no mention made of an aggregate with no elements, an empty aggregate, and if there is such an aggregate, whether it's unique and whether it should be considered a part of other aggregates. However, a notion of an empty aggregate, or aggregate with no elements, is not needed in the present work. Next we have the definition of power, or cardinal number of an aggregate M. Again, it seems that Cantor takes for granted that this definition can be universally understood without further explanation of such phrases as making abstraction of the nature of its various elements, amongst other phrases. I'm just going to spend a few minutes now explaining this definition. What this definition is saying is that if we start with an aggregate of objects M, then each of the objects of M will have its own particular characteristics 
which distinguish it from any other objects in the aggregate. There may also be some kind of order on the objects of the aggregate. So first of all, we deprive each object of its distinguishing characteristics, leaving an aggregate of purely abstract general units, which are indistinguishable from one another except that they still potentially have an order relation defined on them. This is one act of abstraction. The second act of abstraction, resulting in the double act of abstraction mentioned, is to ignore any order amongst the general units, and thus leaving an aggregate m double bar of units, which are completely indistinguishable from one another, and which have no order relation. This is what Cantor means by an intellectual image or projection of m. The double act of abstraction is indicated by the two bars above the m. This aggregate formed, m double bar, is called a cardinal number, and is also called the cardinal number of m. Of course, these two acts of abstraction which make up this double act of abstraction could be carried out in either order, but we'll see in section 7 that there is a preferred order to them. Notice that there doesn't seem to be any doubt in Cantor's mind that every aggregate has a well-defined, definite cardinal number. In the introduction, Cantor is quoted as saying, an aggregate of elements belonging to any sphere of thought is said to be well-defined, when in consequence of its definition, and of the logical principle of the excluded middle, it must be considered as intrinsically determined whether any object belonging to this sphere belongs to the aggregate or not, and secondly, whether two objects belonging to the aggregate are equal or not, in spite of formal differences in the manner in which they are given. What Cantor is saying here is that either an object is an element of a given aggregate or it is not. And whether an object is or is not an element of a given aggregate is not dependent on whether we know it to be or not. He's also saying that even though an object may be symbolised in different ways, the symbolization does not affect the identity of the object. Cantor is also quoted as saying, The conception of power, which contains as a particular case the notion of whole number, may, said Cantor, be considered as an attribute of every well-defined aggregate, whatever conceivable nature its elements may have. The definition of equivalent aggregates which follows the definition of cardinal numbers is fairly self-explanatory. Some of the comments immediately following the definition of equivalent aggregates is used in part A of the proof of theorem D on page 100. We see that following the definition of equivalent aggregates, this equivalence is a reflexive relation between aggregates. This is point 5. And by point 4 of page 86 is a symmetric relation. And finally, by point 6 of page 87 and point 4 of page 86 is a transitive relation between aggregates. We also see that two aggregates have the same cardinal number if and only if they're equivalent. This is the theorem stated at the bottom of page 87. And therefore we can speak of two aggregates being equivalent interchangeably with them having the same cardinal number. With that in mind, I think of the aggregates or cardinal number m double bar as an aggregate which possesses only the minimum required set of properties that any aggregate must necessarily possess in order to have m double bar as its cardinal number. We might think of m double bar as an essence or a platonic form or some kind of prototype aggregate. An aggregate n which has cardinal number m double bar may have properties in addition to those properties possessed by the aggregate m double bar, but n must have as an absolute minimum all of those properties possessed by m double bar. A more concrete analogy may be as follows. It may be the case that there is a minimum set of properties that an animal must possess for it to be classified as a cat. We can think of this minimum set of properties as an ideal, abstract object, an essence, a platonic form, whatever we wish to call it, which must be possessed by every animal that is a cat. Of course, all cats have their own particular characteristics. Some are black, some have long fur, some are overweight, but they must, without exception, have this minimum set of properties or else they couldn't be called a cat. We see that, in accordance with the definition of cardinal number, the cardinal number of an aggregate does not depend on the specific nature of the objects which are elements in the aggregate. We can replace an object of an aggregate M with another object, which will of course result in a new aggregate, and the new aggregate formed has the same cardinal number as the original. This is of course on the understanding that the element of M that is replaced is replaced by an object which is considered as a unity, that is, as a single object itself. This idea forms the basis of the proof that equivalent aggregates have equal cardinal numbers. The converse of the theorem relies on the fact that m double bar is obtained from m by simply considering the elements of m as general units. Clearly, there are as many, in inverted commas, objects in m double bar as in m, and so there is very obviously at least one one-to-one -one correspondence between m double bar and m, and so m is equivalent to m double bar, and similarly for n and n double bar. 
Transitivity of equivalence completes the proof. Note also that since m double bar equals n double bar, then m double bar is equivalent to n double bar, since equivalence is a reflexive relation between aggregates. The statement 9, that m is equivalent to its cardinal number, m double bar, makes sense since m double bar is itself an aggregate, but a special aggregate which has been singled out and classified as a cardinal number. The comment at the top of page 89 again anticipates the concept of union aggregates. This comment on page 89 simply points out that the cardinal number of a union aggregate depends only on the cardinal numbers of the individual aggregates which make up the union aggregates. The specific nature of the elements of the aggregates is irrelevant. Remember that aggregates are equivalent if and only if they have the same cardinal number. Thank you for watching. If you found this video useful then please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. You can see more videos on various topics on my channel and if you have any suggestions for topics for future videos then please feel free to let me know and I'll try my best to put something together. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and keep an eye out for new videos being uploaded to my channel.